Okie dokie. I shall get started. Okay. So, up to this point, we've been doing types of work with R that, aside from a little bit in week four, are things that I would call abstractions. Things where we have been using functions that do complex operations sort of behind the scenes. Things like when we do a filter in dplyr, we just set some condition and say if it equals this, keep it. Behind the scenes, there's some more action going on. It's actually generating a logical vector. It's applying that logical vector to a subsetting function under the hood. It's doing a bunch of things, right? That's pretty abstract because we can just do some really simple little operation, really, really simple little argument to a function. It does some crazy stuff in the background. Um, today is going to be one of the first days about proper programming. When I say proper programming, I mean being very specific about telling a computer how to do something programmatically. Today we're going to be talking about loops and a little bit about flow control. So uh, the basis for this is the idea of doing repetition well. Doing repetition badly is something most people who do data analysis are guilty of doing, mainly because they don't know better. So bad repetition can look something like this. Basically, you know, somebody doesn't know any better and they wanted to get the mean, say, of every variable in the Swiss data set. If we remember the Swiss data set we used way back in the first week of class, they wanted to get a mean for every variable in here. They might do it something like this. Get mean one, two, three, four, five, six, and just run mean on every single one of them. Okay, when you look at this, can you spot all the problems up here? What typos do you see up here? Yep. So this examination here, we've forgotten a comma down here. Yeah, yeah, there's mean five, man six, there's mean five, mean five, right? And there's two fertilities. Fertility and fertility, right? This is, it's pretty common to make typos, and sometimes it's common to make lots of typos. The thing you'll note about this is if you have a lot of really similar things, it can be really hard to spot every potential typo in there at the same time. It's a common to make lots of them, you might not notice them, and these are the kinds of little problems that will drive you insane, because most of the typos up there are actually not going to generate an error. The missing comma is going to generate an error. The missing dollar sign is going to generate an error there. Having fertility here and fertility there, you're just going to get a mean that's the same. You might never even know you'd assign the wrong variable to that, right? You also probably might not even notice that you have mean 5, mean 5. You just didn't get a mean for this variable over here, and you might be trying to figure that out. These are the sorts of things that are insidious, right? Okay, but you could at least conceivably get a mean on six variables this way. On the other hand, if you had a data set that had 200 columns, if this is the only way you know how to do something like this, you are going to be really unhappy with that task. You're going to have to write 200 lines like that. You might resort to copying and pasting and then hunting through to figure out why some of your numbers are off, why some of them are wrong. Honestly, I don't think any single file of code should even be 200 like lines long. And if so, if it takes 200 lines to do one operation, you're definitely doing something wrong. Okay. Good repetition. Good repetition is you write some kind of statement once and then let the computer take care of the repetitive part of it. You write a statement once and then make the computer do that same thing to multiple objects. So today, we're going to learn some general solutions to repetitive analysis or repetitive sort of function operation. And then we're going to learn some sort of better and more specific ones next week. But this is the most general <clears throat> one. So you might do something like this. This is something called a loop, which I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about today. This is a way to get, say in this case, I want to get the means of all of the variables in the Swiss data set, but I only ever want to tell it exactly what operation I'm going to run once. I'm going to say what I want is the mean of Swiss, and then I have some code here that's going to tell the computer how to repetitively get those means over and over again assign them to some object and then display it. This is the means of all the variables in the Swiss data set without me ever having specified manually a single one of those variables. Okay? This is using some complex things I've only briefly talked about or haven't introduced at all. Like the set names function here. Set names is just a shortcut for creating an object and then assigning names to it. We're going to use it a couple times today. Um, 
and numeric here is just a shortcut for creating a numeric vector. Anyway, this doesn't have to make sense to you, but know that this small amount of code, it's just a little bit shorter than this, really. It's only a line or so shorter than that. This, however, I could modify absolutely nothing, not a single bit of this code, if the Swiss data set had 10,000 columns in it, this would work exactly the same way and generate 10,000 means without me changing a single entry on this. That is the ideal way you want your code to work if it might have to be used more than once. Something repetitive, it just scales arbitrarily, it just works. Okay, so the idea, the general idea for programming, whenever possible, is dry, stay dry. Do not repeat yourself. Computers are really good at doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. People get worse each time they do the same thing again. We inevitably fuck up, right? Where we're like, okay, I'm doing the same thing, doing the same thing, doing the same thing. Even try saying the same word over and over and over again and see how long you go before you start to have gibberish come out, right? We're not good at that. So writing code to repeat tasks for us reduces the most common human coding mistakes, which are being lazy or inattentive. Humans get lazy and inattentive really fast. That is perfectly fine, right? We, we shouldn't be doing things that we find really boring or doing the same thing over and over again. Automation exists for that reason, right? Okay. It also, doing repetitive things, having the computer do repetitive things rather, will substantially reduce the time and effort involved in processing large volumes of data. If you had to manually assign all 200 of those means, you just lost all of that time for essentially no gain. You will not get those minutes or hours of your life back again, so don't do that, right? Reducing the time and effort in everything is what computers are sort of all about. They prevent us from having to do all this boring stuff. And from a sort of a philosophical standpoint, if you develop really good skills in doing something repetitive, that's nice, but those are not valuable skills. If you have valuable skills in something that can be automated, you should probably be replaced by a computer, right? There's a reason why the computer does it, right? If, if it does it equally well as you, it's going to do it in one one hundredth the time and more reliably than you. So learning having good skills in a repetitive thing is generally not useful. Having good skills in making a computer do repetitive things for you is a valuable and marketable skill. Okay. So. Compact code, that is code that sort of does these repetitive actions using relatively small amount of code to begin with, is also much more easily read and much easier to troubleshoot than lots and lots of identical code spammed all the way up and down a page, right? If it works for one iteration, works for one assignment, it's probably gonna work for every other one. And if it breaks on one of them, you only have to edit the one place where it breaks. If it breaks, on 200 lines you've written and you have to edit every single one of them, that is an enormous amount of work. Okay, so the agenda for today is fundamental programming stuff. Today I'm going to talk mostly about for loops, a little bit about while loops, and these are both general methods. And when I say a general method, I mean it's something that you could theoretically solve any problem you have in R using a loop. You shouldn't, but you sure can. So it's a universal tool. I'm waiting until week six to introduce it because if I introduce it at the beginning, every single thing you did in this class, you would have ended up looping it because it's really easy to think of a way to loop things. These are also general methods outside of R. The methods I use or the methods that I'm gonna show you for generating loops apply to just about every other programming language. I can't think of any programming language off the top of my head that doesn't have loop functionality because it's sort of the purpose of computers is doing something repetitive, right? Um, loops are, fundamentally like universal to computing. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. Next week, we're gonna talk about writing our own functions. So all the different functions we've used in R to this point, things like the filter command, summarize, all that, somebody wrote those functions and it's perfectly easy for you to write your own functions that do things like that. They might not do something as complex as summarize or filter like that, but sometimes you're gonna come up with something and be like, well, I've got five, six, 10, 20 lines of code but I need to keep doing that over and over again. You can encapsulate it in a function and then just call the function instead of calling 15 or 20 lines of code. I tend to try and wrap like a lot of code in the things I do in functions. Anything I'm gonna use more than once gets put into a function and I call the function instead. Right? That's sort of a, a basic software engineering thing. 
Okay. Then next week we'll learn how to do loops based on functions that we create and also how to vectorize over those functions. Okay. So what is a loop? I'll be bad here and I will cite Wikipedia because this is a great statement of what a loop is. A loop is a sequence of statements which is specified once but which may be carried out several times in succession. The code inside the loop is obeyed a specified number of times or once for each of a collection of items or until some condition is met or indefinitely or forever. So if you ever notice when you have your cell phone, say you have your cell phone displaying your clock like this, after about 60 seconds it's going to update to the next minute on here. The thing that is running your clock in your phone is a loop. It's waiting for a certain number of oscillations of a quartz crystal to pop up for it to go to the next one. Actually, this one is synchronizing to the cell phone tower. But if it was offline, it would be waiting for oscillations of a quartz crystal. It's a loop that is perpetually running. Every single thing that runs on every electronic device that you have, everything that runs on every computer you have is a loop. The loop is waiting for something or it's counting to things. But they're all loops. When I say a loop is a general method, I mean everything in computing is usually running on some sort of a loop. So the methods here are incredibly general. If you look in any kind of software, anywhere that's run, things that wait for user input, it's always a loop of some kind saying, okay, don't do anything until somebody gives some input, sit there, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing. If it detects a mouse click, oh, do something, wake up. When your computer wakes up from sleep, there's actually a low power state where it has a loop waiting for user input. It just seems like it's just instantaneously responding. In fact, it's actually polling and checking only every you know, 50 to 100 milliseconds for some kind of input. But if a computer only has to pulse back on every 100 milliseconds, it's not using power for the other 99 milliseconds that it's off. It's power saving. Anyway, loops are everywhere. They're universal. Okay. The type of loop most common in repetitive data analysis in R is something called the for loop. The function for it in R is just for. For loops are what I call the most general kind of loop. Every programming language I am aware of has a for loop um, other than incredibly early 1950s, 60s programming languages. Um, the way a for loop should be thought of as for each of these values you give to the loop, in order through those values, do something. So conceptually, you'll have some sort of values that you want, some set of values you want to run through. You will set an index variable equal to the first value. A common programming convention is the index is going to be i, but it could be anything you want, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Once i is set to its first value, do some set of things. That set of things will usually depend on the current value of i. When it completes that, go and check to see if there is a next value that you could assign i to. If there were three values, it would do the first value, the second value, the third value. There's no fourth value. If there's no fourth value or no next value, exit the loop. If there is a next value, change i to the next value and repeat two. Okay? The idea is that we are looping through values and repeating some action. Graphically, it looks something like this. Outside of the loop, you will set i to the first value. Very often, i is just going to be like the number 1. It's going to be the first element, say, of a vector. Then, this is the inside of a loop. And you can see why it's called a loop. It's just an actual loop, right? You will run code using i. You then say, are there more values of i? If there are, go to the next value, do it again, do it again. If there's 10 million values, it will do this 10 million times, it will run out, and then it will exit the loop and finish. It will keep running perpetually until it runs out of values. Okay? There's another type of loop which never runs out of values that's just called, uh, I forget the default name in R for it, it's called repeat. Sometimes you want to do that if you're, say, scraping data perpetually from Twitter or something. You just say, run it until I shut the computer down. You might do that. Four has a, a built-in limit based on the number of values that you give it. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about this? It's a sort of idea. It's just something repetitive. Okay, here's a very simple example in R. In this case, what I want to do is I'm going to say for some set of values, in this case I'm using the values 1 through 10, for i in 1 colon 10, 1 colon 10 is all of the integers from 1 to 10, for i in 10, I want to print i squared. So what happens? 
I run this loop, and then it does. It runs 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, so on to 10 squared. Right? And you'll see it has one line for each print command that ran, because it actually ran the print command 10 times. It ran, this is the inside of the loop, it ran the contents of the loop one time for every value that I was looping through. 1 colon 10 is a vector of length 10, so it ran through the interior of this 10 times. One time for every possible value of i. i is just being replaced with whatever value we're, that we're currently on. Does that make sense? Okay. So, these would do exactly the same thing. If I said for i in 1 to 3, print i squared, I get 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared. It is doing the exact same thing as over here. Setting i to 1, then i squared, then set i to 2, i squared, set i to 3, i squared. These are doing the exact same thing. But this is me breaking it out and doing it manually. The only thing the loop is doing is, uh, is I am allowing r to change that value of i for me based on some vector of values I've given it. Okay? Straightforward? Doesn't seem too bad? So it's tremendously powerful, and we'll see why as we uh, continue on. Okay, so there's some conventions to the iterations in a loop. An iteration is every time you go through a loop, right? So the first time that loop is run for the first value of i, that is the, fir the first iteration. If we have like 100 values we loop through in that loop, the 100th value is the 100th iteration of the loop, okay? Iterating over the indices 1 to n is really common. Before we went over 1 to 10 and then 1 to 3. n might be, for instance, the length of a vector where we're going to operate on every element of the vector. It might be the, name, the number of rows or columns in a matrix or data frame where we want to do some operation once on each row or once on each column. Or it might be the length of a list where we want to do something to every element of that list. But that would be going from 1 to, say, length of list or one to n row data frame for the rows of a data frame. But that's just a numeric vector or an integer vector from one to whatever is the length of the object we're iterating over. Common notation for loops is that i will be the object that holds the current value inside the loop. You can put a loop inside of another loop, inside of another loop, inside of another loop. You can put as many loops inside of each other as you want. As you go inside loops, the convention is usually i will be whatever changes the fastest, j will be the next fastest changing, k will be the next after that. So i, j, k, this kind of notation, you may have encountered before, in fact you probably have if you've taken any math classes or statistics classes, because the notation for a loop is identical for the indexing of mathematical symbols and operations. The summation operator, sum n i equals 1, is a loop operator. This is saying I want to begin i equals 1. That is the first iteration. I want to sum to iteration n, the nth item. The operator I'm going to do is I'm going to sum. And that's saying take the whatever is the first item, add it to the second item, to the third item, to the fourth item, until I hit n items and add them all together. Okay. This is a nice hint. If you encounter statistical things in the future, if you see notation like this, 100% of the time, you could write a loop in code that will do exactly whatever that mathematical operator is. Okay. Another thing to note is that i, j, k, whatever you use as that variable that stores your index value, those are just normal objects in R. There's nothing special about it being i, j, or k. You could name them whatever you want. If I'm iterating over the rows or columns of a data frame or matrix, instead of i, I might name this object row, and instead of j, I might name it call for column. You can give them informative names like any other variable. I often use i, j, and k if I'm doing just sort of mathematical operations or it's really obvious to me. In almost all other cases, if it's gonna be anything reasonably complicated, I will be very specific what I'm currently iterating over. I think we're only gonna do one nested loop today and it will be very clear what thing is what. Another thing is that what we're iterating over doesn't have to be numbers like 1 to n. It doesn't have to be numbers at all. We could also iterate over a character vector. For instance, here I'm saying some letters is equal to the fourth through sixth letters of the alphabet. 
that is the letters D, E, and F. Then I say, for I in some letters, print I. It prints D, E, and F. So the first iteration of this, I is replaced with the first element of this vector, the letter D. It then prints D. There's nothing else to do, so it goes back and checks for more values. Oh, there's a next value. It's the letter E. Replace I with E, print E. There's another value, F. Replace I with F, print it. Right? It's just running down a character vector. It don't, don't have to give it numbers or anything. We can give it anything. Anything with multiple elements, it will run right down those elements and replace I with whatever element is there. Okay? An interesting thing about loops in R is whatever I is assigned to through this loop, that object exists outside of the loop too. If I finish running this loop here and then just type I into my console and hit it, I get F. Well, F was the last value I took when the loop finished. I is nothing special. It is just an object whose value has changed at every iteration of the loop. At the end of it, it's not like it deletes it or gets rid of it. It's just sitting there and it's named I. Something I've said in this class before is usually we don't like object names to be like one letter or something. About the only exception in common R programming to that is using I, J, and K for iterations. Just remember you're doing that. Most of the time I prefer to use something that's at least three or four letters long just to set it aside. Does this make sense how this is working? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, actually. I will be overridden when the loop. So the way 4 works is I did not exist before this. Um, well, no, it will be overridden. It will be overridden. Uh, yeah. You could manually set the I value inside. You shouldn't have to clear I. You should actually test that. It's a good question. I'm, I'm about 75% sure that it should clear it. But it occurs to me that I've never actually tested that. So I'm going to write a loop really quick in front of you, try not to butcher it completely, and we'll see what happens. Come on. Our script. Or I in uh, 1 to 5, I'm going to say uh, print I. It just writes it over. That makes sense because this first function for here should, what it should actually be doing is allocating a new empty i and assigning the first value to it. So that would make sense. Great question. Okay. Yeah, and if you ever want me to live code something like that, I know my slides don't have like live coding up here, just ask. I will usually stop unless we're completely swamped. All the really long lectures this term are now over, so I have time to actually stop and code. Okay, so there's a helpful function in R that saves you from typing one, two, length of something. It's a very common thing that we want to iterate over is starting at one and then just having all the integers into whatever number is the length of an object. There's a function in R called sequence along that takes care of this for us. So let's say we want to loop over something which is not numeric but we want a numeric index for it. So like, let's say we want to loop over, in this case I did some letters, the letters D, E, and F, but I actually inside the loop want I to be the number position of that letter, not the letter itself. So when, when it's in the first iteration, I don't want it to be D, I want it to be the number one, but I want the, the number of integers to be the same length as the length of whatever object I'm working with, which is some letters. Sequence along does that. So if I give sequence along something that is length 3, it's going to generate an integer vector of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. It generates a sequence of numbers along the length of something you give it. This loop here I'm saying, for every value in sequence along some letters, sequence along some letters is just the numbers 1, 2, and 3, because some letters is length 3, inside my loop I want to replace A with number one, then number two, then number three as we go through those iterations. What are we going to do inside the loop? We're going to do something mildly complicated. What we're going to do is, and, and this is nested function, so we read inside out, 
we're going to say, I want to paste together this text. The text is going to be letter blank, the object A, colon, some letters, bracket A. So what this is going to do is it's going to replace this with whatever is the current iteration. Remember, the iteration is iterating over the sequence along. So for the first iteration, A equals the number one. Over here, it's going to take some letters, the vector, and subset it to its first element. So it's going to replace A with one. Some letters, subset one, is going to be the letter D for the first iteration. So we loop through these three things, and it says letter one is letter D. Some letters, bracket one, is D. The second letter is E. The third letter is F by pasting some text together. Does that make sense how that works? People have questions about that. It's somewhat complicated. There's a few different steps going on. Ha, how do I get D here? Ah, so in the first iteration, A here is being replaced by the number one, right? Well, some letters is the vector D, E, and F. I created it from letters four to six. So this is taking, this is a vector D, E, F, so its first element is the letter D. So you carry that over from the previous yeah. slide. Okay. Yeah, all the stuff is accumulative through the slides. Yeah. And then, like before, if I finish running this loop and then call on A, which was the thing I was iterating over, it's just the number three. Because in the last iteration of this, A was replaced with the number three, and then over here it was subsetting to the third value of some letters. Right? So this is something complex. I'm both inserting a value here and I'm subsetting based on the value that we're currently on in the loop. So A is actually the number one in the first iteration. So if we set, use the brackets for subsetting and we give it a number, it just gives you that, that numbered element of, the, of some letters. So the le it's the letters D, E, and F. If I give it a one, it gives me D. If I give it a two, it gives me E. If I give it a three, it gives me F. I'm just replacing A with a number in both cases. In this case, I'm printing the actual number, but here I'm only using the number for subsetting. Do you want to see the inside of that loop and how it works? I'll do it. Let's go like this. I'm going to copy this. Okay. So I'm going to say some letters is uh, letters four through six. Prints, it works. Okay. If I took this exact thing right here, and instead, I just replaced A with 1. That's all the first iteration is doing. Letter 1D. So the question then might be, well, what the hell is this? Sequence along some letters is just the number 1, 2, and 3. Right? Some letters is DEF. This sequence along converts this DEF into the, the integers 1, 2, 3. Basically, some letters this sequence along is exactly the same as saying so sequence along some letters is the same as saying one to length some letters so begin at the number one and go to whatever length some letters is length some letters is the number three does that make sense how that's working? ish there I'll replicate the entire loop. That's the loop. The loop is literally doing exactly that. I get that. I guess I just don't know. I guess I just have a hard time figuring out where that A comes from. Ah, yeah. So that's the thing. Um, the A isn't coming from anywhere. The A is actually being created by that for command up there. Oh, yeah, no, I did see, I changed the letter on purpose to mess with everyone. I'm trying to give the idea that, that this can be arbitrary. So instead of A here, A here, I could put the word weasels up here. I could replace all of those A's with weasels. It is perfectly happy to print and do the exact same loop. 
A is a variable and it's arbitrary. We often use one letters because it stuffs in there easily, but this is to show it doesn't matter what you use as long as you're consistent, okay? Absolutely, yeah, it just looked up there and it occurred to me that uh, I might want to Well, it actually, does it actually work? Oh, yeah, but now it's cycling me to, uh, yeah, I just hit control plus and it got very grumpy with me for a second. You should be able to, but this is an outdated R studio, so it's a little iffy. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Easier to read? That big enough? Nope. That's a good example of something to yell at me for. If I have been working with lots of tiny text and you're like, I cannot read your hieroglyphics, please just tell me and I will take care of that. Okay. Back to the lecture. Okay. Well, actually, are there any other questions on this? How this voodoo magic is working? No. Good. Okay. So, usually when you're using a for loop, <clears throat> you aren't just printing output. These examples I did here were printing output to show like how it's working live. Um, normally what you wanna do is you wanna run some sort of calculation once for each iteration that we're gonna do. Normally we wanna store the output from those calculations somewhere. To do that, we need to pre-allocate somewhere to put that stuff. So for pre-allocating something, what you need to do first is you need to figure out what it is that you're going to be creating with your loop and then create some object that can fit all of those elements you're going to create in it. Normally you'd start with missing values as something that you'll um, write over. So an example, let's say that you're running some sort of loop and every iteration of the loop is going to produce a single numeric value. You'd probably wanna store a single numeric value in each element of a numeric vector. To do that, you would say, I want to create something which is a numeric of length number of iterations. So the numeric function, whatever you give as its first argument here, it's going to create a vector of that length, which is numeric. By default, it's going to be filled with zeros. You could fill it with something else if you want, but it doesn't matter. You're going to overwrite every single one of them. If your loop is going to produce text, like the previous loop we did right here was producing character output, this is a single element of character output or a string, we would want to have a character vector of length equal to the number of iterations. So each one of those iterations would be saved in each element of a character vector. If you're gonna do produce only trues and falses, you just want a logical vector. Maybe you have a loop that every time the loop runs through an iteration, it produces an entire numeric vector and all the vectors it produces are gonna be the same length. You could store them as columns in a matrix. Right? or rows in a matrix, depending on what you want to do. So in this case, I've done it so that each iteration produces a row and each column is some value in it. So let's say that you had a loop that produces always a vector that is 10 items long in numbers. Well, you want a matrix that has 10 columns, right? one for each one of those values, and then a number of rows equal to the number of iterations you run. Okay. Maybe your loop produces some sort of complicated object. For instance, today I'm going to show loops that produce linear regressions. You could save all of those linear regression outputs to each element of a list. For that, you could populate a list with vector list number of iterations. This is the way you create a list that is empty. You say it's a vector of type list and its length is the number of iterations. This is because lists are actually a type of vector. We're going to get some experience with pre-allocating <clears throat> here today. So, for instance, let's say that we want to run some loop that's going to produce numeric output. One number per iteration, so I know we're going to pre-allocate a numeric vector and fill up all of the elements of that vector. We do something like this. First thing I'm doing here is I'm going to say we're going to have a loop that runs through 10 iterations. So I say iters is equal to 10. My output is equal to, or my output is going to be pre-allocated with a vector numeric iterations. So remember iterations is the number 10, so this is numeric 10 will be output. That means output to begin with is going to be a length 10 numeric vector where all the elements are zero to begin with. 
doesn't matter what they are because we're going to overwrite all of them. Then we're going to run a loop that calculates something. This says for i in 1 to iters. So how many iterations are we running here? 10 iterations. The first value is going to be 1. The last value is going to be 10. And all the intervening integers will be iterations. We are going to say, I want to write to the if element of output i minus 1 squared plus i minus 2 squared. So the first element of output is going to be equal to i minus 1 squared. Well, that's 0 squared, nothing, plus 1 minus 2, negative 1 squared is 1. So we get a 1. 2 minus 1 squared is 1, plus 0 is 1. Then it starts to increase geometrically. Okay. So what we've done here, and this is a common thing you'll do with any kind of loop of this general structure, you will figure out how many iterations you want to run. You will pre-allocate some vector of the appropriate length, one element for every iteration you're going to run, and then run the iterations where the output is some output of a function. In this case, we did 10 iterations where the output is a mathematical function of each iteration number. And this was our output. Does that make sense how I'm doing that? It makes sense what output is as an object and how I created it. Mm -hmm. Ah, great question. So if I had not pre-allocated this, it's going to be attempting to add or attempting to set this mathematical function as the value of output 1. Well, output doesn't exist at all. So if I go over to, let's just grab all this code. Today's a good day for copying and pasting a bunch of code in here. Okay. So I'm not going to create output. I'm going to create iterations. If I do this... It's just going to say object output not found. Because what it's really doing is it's just trying, I mean, it's just trying to find output, right? It's going to give you an error because it hasn't been made yet. The preallocation is a necessary step. If I do something like output but assign it 9, so it's one element shorter than what we expect, it's still going to work. The reason for that is it's going to append it to the end of it. Right? So technically, I could just do something like output numeric 1. And it will still do it as long as there's a numeric vector. Because R, without asking, will append to the end of objects. But normally, you want to specify the appropriate length to begin with because it will behave unpredictably if these things are not the appropriate length. For instance, um, with lists, it'll usually append, but sometimes it'll do some wonky stuff. Um, another reason is maybe, actually, you don't want to know about that. Basically, always make sure to append, to set it to the actual size you want. Otherwise, strange things may happen. Okay. Yes? I don't get it. Why you put numeric ones? You get the same result. Hmm. Ah. So numeric 1 is generating a, a basically an empty numeric vector of length 1. But if we remember, so let's say I create a new vector. I'm just going to call it new vec is just equal to the number 1. If I run new vec, it's number 1. Now if I say new vector 2 is equal to 2, new vec now has two elements. Because this is how you create a new element in something. Well, that's the operation we're doing inside of that loop. It doesn't matter. Replacing a value in R and adding and appending a new value to it is the exact same operation. So it's perfectly happy to let us do it. However, you cannot create a brand new object. Like, I, let's say I could say new vec2. I can't go like that and create new vec2. I can't create a new object like this. I could create a new object like that. And that's just because R is quite particular. Does that answer your question? Yeah. These little intricacies that matter a lot and will give you weird errors. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. So the set names function is a handy little function for pre-allocating a named vector. Let's say what I want to do 
is I want to run through some loop or something where um, I have, I'm storing the values for each iteration, but I also name each one of those values. Because remember, we can name elements of a vector, right? So that you have values in it, but you could also do names on that vector and get the names out. Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, the names that I want to assign to the vector I'm going to preallocate are going to be equal to, in this case, I did paste zero, iter, space, letters one through five. It's going to vector recycle iteration to be equal to this length. So the names that pop out are going to be iteration A, iteration B, C, D, and E. Right? Does that make sense how that's working? I'm just pasting text together. I'm just going to use those as names. Okay. <clears throat> then one way I could assign those names to say a pre-allocated vector would be to say a vector is numeric 5, so a length 5 numeric vector. I could assign names to it as names to use manually, or I can do it all in one line of code, where I say a vector is equal to set names. This is the object I want to create, which is a length 5 numeric vector. These are the names I want to assign to it. And this pops out. <clears throat> the vector is all zeros, because a numeric command automatically generates a numeric vector that contains all zeros. But now all these elements have the names that I assign to it. This does the exact same thing as this, but this goes a little bit better on a single line. Later on, if you decide to make functions that assign or generate data or something like that, this will work much better inside a function than this will, but otherwise they're equivalent. I use this because it saves me one line of code, and anytime I can save one line of code, I generally do it. <clears throat> that make sense? You set names, try it out. It's kind of a nice little function. <clears throat> okay, so now I've shown the sort of foundation of loops, but I haven't really demonstrated the power that loops give you to do complex things. So for most of the rest of today, we're going to go through an extended regression example. I don't expect anyone in the class to know anything about regression, but you'll still be able to understand programmatically what is happening in here. And the neat thing about this example is that I'm actually going to show you how to run multiple regression models for something, and then I'm going to show you how to do k-fold cross-validation. K-fold cross-validation is something that pretty much anyone might want to use in actual, like if you're doing statist predictive statistical modeling of something, cross-validation is the generally accepted most common way of validating results and providing fit statistics for a bunch of models or something in a paper. It turns out it's really, really easy to do with loops in R. So I include it as part of this lecture. Okay, so first idea here. <clears throat> Suppose we have some data we don't know much about, we want to try fitting several different models to these data, okay? I'm saying regression here. Is anyone in here not familiar with regression at all? Okay, it's good. I'm just saying it's perfectly fine not to be familiar with it. It just means I will clarify some things and not breeze through some stuff. Okay, stop me at any point if you want. <clears throat> okay, so let's say we want to store the results of fitting each of the regression models we want as elements of a list so we can compare them. We're going to store them as elements of a list because regression output is a really big list item. We can't store it as like a single element of a vector because it won't fit. We're going to do each output of a regression as an element of a list. Okay. To do this consistently, we're going to write a loop. The idea there is that if we had only two models, this code would work. If we scaled it up and had 200 different regression models, we would use the exact same code to fit all of those models. It doesn't matter. Loops tend to scale. They scale reasonably well. The limitation is generally your processing uh, power and your RAM, but they scale generally pretty well. Okay. Then after we do this, we're going to do k-fold cross-validation to get an estimate of their actual predictive accuracy for out-of-sample predictions. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to simulate some data that I can actually run these models on. This is another thing that will probably be useful to you, either has already been useful to you in a stats class or will be in the future if you take any more, is being able to simulate data, particularly simulate data that are correlated with one another so you can test models. So in this case, um, right here, I, I set the seed up here. It's something I very commonly do for like these slides. If you're doing it for a class, you might not necessarily want to set the seed. This just means that the random numbers always come out the same in my slides. Um, most of the time, it doesn't matter. I want to create data that n is 300. So there are going to be 300 observations in my data. 
My x variable is going to be equal to our norm, number of observations, so 300. The data are mean 5, standard deviation 4. Then my sim data, my actual data frame, is going to be data frame. x is just equal to the x variable I create right here. But then I say, OK, I want y to be a function of x. So I say y is equal to negative 0.5 times x plus 0 0.05 times x squared plus some stochastic error term, some randomly distributed error term, size n300, standard deviation 1. So I've essentially added a standard deviation 1 error term on the outside of something. Yeah? So the R norm is a stochastic like randomization function? Kind of. So if I go R norm 20, uh, how about I do R norm 20, 5, and uh, 1? This is going to create 20 observations whose mean is 5 and their standard deviation is 1. So these are the random numbers I generated. If I say, I'm saying test vec, if I get mean on test vec, it's about 5. And its standard deviation is about 1. So this uses a random number generator to to get data that have some kind of parameters that are desirable to us. Yeah? What about like 95% CI? It's not like a standard deviation, but it's a different parameter? Uh, so because our norm generates a, a normal distribution, the 95% CIs are going to be hovering right around about 1.96 of that standard deviation. Yeah, so I just said standard deviation one. You can't directly give it a like 95% confidence interval, but if you know the data are normally distributed, you could invert that normal distribution and get the appropriate standard deviation for those bounds. Um, I, something I might introduce in week 10 or 11 this term that I'm thinking of is how to take parameter estimates from models um, and their variance covariance matrix, put it into a multivariate normal distribution and output simulated parameters. It's a way to get um, uh, asymptotically correct standard errors and like um, confidence intervals around things for models. It's something that if you've ever taken Chris Adolph's MLE visualization class or anything, he does with a package called SimCF, but I know how to do it in about five lines of code and I'm going to teach you guys probably in week 11. Very powerful. Very cool. Um, but it's by inverting that. Make sense? Doesn't have to. Okay. So, this essentially just creates a simple data frame where we have some x variable, some y variable that's correlated with it, but not perfectly correlated with it. You can't run a regression on something where the y is a perfect, or x is perfectly predicts y. Okay, so we have a data frame now, 300 observations, y dependent on x. Um, and something that's kind of funny, this is a, a good link if you pop up in the slides. Um, in 2014 in political science, there was a, a pretty big scandal when somebody managed to publish a paper in science that later it turned out he had obviously falsified all of the data in his paper by taking an existing data set and then just adding a plus R norm call to it and adding some random noise and then publishing it in fucking science, right? <laughs> the top journal. Um, yeah, turned out just use the R norm function. Caused a, a big scene, but... but um, yeah, fun link. So um, if you are going to falsify data, do something a little more complex than using the base R norm function. Maybe you'll get away with it. Apparently, probably. Okay, so if we plot these data, so I'm just hucking our simulated data into ggplot, x is x, y is y. These are what our data look like. If you saw what I was using as the parameters of it, it makes sense that the data look like this. It's kind of a inverse parabola, but it's noisy because we have a standard deviation one noise added to it. It's not a perfect function of our, uh, y is not a perfect function of x. Okay, so you look at this and we're like, we want to fit some models to these data and see what model fits best. Okay, so we have a few different candidate regression models. I'm going to use very basic models to anybody who's taken a regression class. So we might want to consider several models. The basic model is an intercept only. An intercept only model that is y equals just b0 is basically using, it, it is using the mean of y as an estimator, right? It draws a horizontal line through the data and says, that's the best we, job we can do at predicting y. The linear model draws some line through the data based on a function of x. 
So there's some intercept like this before, but then the line has a slope to it, curving up and down, depending on values of x. Not curving, but pivoting. Next might be a quadratic model. Quadratic model adds an x squared term and makes it parabolic in some way. It still can slope up and down. It still has some intercept, but now it has a bend to it at the same time. Lastly, a cubic model, which creates something sinusoidal. So it creates a curve that goes up and then comes back down and then back up again. Okay. These are really common types of polynomials we might fit in a regression model. We just want to see which one fits the best. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is we need to actually run all these models. We could manually do four different LM calls and save the output of them and compare them all. But as an example, I'm going to do these LM calls using a loop. So the first thing I want to do is I want to name off the actual models I want to run. The models that I want to run, I'm going to create a named vector. If you're familiar with regression in R, the way regression works is you give it some formula to fit the data to. This right here is going to be a vector of formulas. I'm saying intercept only model is the name for something that contains y tilde 1. That is the format that you would write y just depends on some intercept and find that intercept for me. The linear model is equal to y tilde x. So that is fit an intercept plus some beta on that x variable. So fit a slope. Quadratic is y tilde x plus i x squared. That's sort of one of the notations R accepts for fitting a quadratic term. And then the cubic model has the quadratic and the cubic in it. Okay, so this right here is a named vector. If I copy paste this out, this is what it looks like. It has a name for each element, like models only, and then each one contains some text that is the formula we're going to use to run a model. If I had a model with the variables yx and I just put y tilde x inside lm, it would run a, y, a regression of uh, y on x. Right? Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to preallocate some list to store the fitted models. It has to be a list because regression outputs list objects. Yes? Sorry, what's lm again? Linear model. Okay. Yeah, LM by default fits a ordinary least squares linear regression. Um, yeah. Which is very, very fast, which is what's nice about it. Okay, we're going to pre-allocate a list to store the models. The list, obviously, is a list. To do that, I say, we're going to create an object called fitted LMs, our fitted linear models, is equal to some kind of vector. The vector type is a list. Its length is equal to models. So now we have an empty list. It contains nothing, but it has four elements, one for each model that we're going to fit. Okay? Because it makes a list, makes it of that length. The names we are going to assign to each element of that list is just the names of the models. So names, models. It's going to make them equal to that. And then this is what that object is. So its first element is intercept only, its second is linear, its third is quadratic, its fourth is cubic. It's just an empty list. It's null, 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 null. When you create an empty list, its elements are all equal to null. Okay. It's basically like, kind of like NA, but it's beyond that. It's saying no element even exists here. Okay. So we've pre-allocated this thing. Does that pre-allocation make sense? Basically, you've created a bunch of empty space with names. Okay. <clears throat> so next thing we want to do, we're going to loop over that models vector I created and then fit each one of those models and then store it in the appropriate slot of that list we created. So <clears throat> the formula function in R will convert some character string that looks like a formula into an actual formula LM can read. So I'm going to use that right here in LM. This is what this loop does here. It says for each model name, so notice what here I'm looping over is for mod in names of the models. I'm looping over the names of the models, not the models themselves. For each model name, Model name is going to replace mod in here. Fit a linear model using the formula that has that particular name. So model subset mod. I'll run some of these here in a second to give an example. And then assign the output of this linear regression to the element of fitted linear models 
whose name is mod. Okay, so what does this look like? If I go here, So, if I pulled out this, okay, so the names of the models are what we're going to iterate over. So for the first iteration of this loop, mod, the thing we're looping over inside here, mod is going to be the text intercept only, right? So essentially what the first iteration is doing is it's replacing mod with intercept only in both of those, okay? Well, this is selecting the intercept only element of the list. This over here is selecting the named element of models that's named intercept only, which is Y tilde one. And it's running a model on it. I haven't actually simulated the data, so I can't run this here. But does that make sense how that's working? I'm taking advantage of named subsetting here. It's pretty complicated. Questions on here? Mod is the I. Yes, mod is essentially what I'm using instead of I in here to liberate us from the idea of being stuck with using I. But you could easily use I instead. This is an example of using an informative name for whatever variable you're iterating over for the index variable. <laughs> So, would you do that when you kind of fill these things without data first? So what? So like, we don't have data for these models yet. Mm -hmm. So when you when you build regression models, would you do something like this where you simulated data? Would you, yeah, kind of structure it first. Or would you yeah. Well, um, if I'm going to build and if I'm writing some new statistical routine, so I've written a few statistical methods for things, and if I'm going to do that, what I will do is I will use random number generation like that with some known structure. Like I know, if I know the statistical routine should perform well with data structured like this, I will use those like R norm functions to generate data that have the appropriate structure and then feed them into a model like this. Make sure it works as expected and then go get the real data in the world that I think un has an underlying structure like that and see how it performs on that. Um, that's how you would ver validate or, and build any new statistical method. I mean, every statistician on campus who builds a new method is going to do some sort of counterfactual fake data like that because they can control the data generating process that like makes those data. They'll test it and then be like, well, if it works for this, I know it's going to work for real world data that come from the same process. So this is how I would do it and how I do it in my work. Um, basically like this. I don't, don't necessarily run lots of models this way, but in similar ways. The k-fold cross-validation we're going to do in a minute is something I actually do in my work, uh, not reasonably, not, not too rarely. Okay, so that last bit of code, so this line of code here, that ran all of those models. I haven't shown the output for it because it's a massive bunch of list objects. This was everything that was necessary to run all four of those linear models. If our models vector here had 100 models, this exact same code would produce a list with 100 different estimated models, right? It'll just work for an arbitrary number of models. Okay. Thing is, though, is what we're interested in isn't like the parameter estimates of those models or anything. We're interested to see which one of these models predicts our data the best. So for that, I want to extract predicted values from these models. And then I want to plot them because pretty pictures are better than numbers. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get predicted y values from each of the x values that actually exist in our data and see what they look like. So I'm going to create a new data frame called predicted data that as a foundation is just going to use our simulated data. So when I create it right here, it means predicted data contains the original x column and y column from our data we generated. Then I'm going to add some stuff to it. I'm going to say here, for, again, looping over the names of the model. So for model in names of models, we're going to loop over all those names of the different models. I'm going to say to predicted data, bracket, bracket, mod. So what is this that I'm assigning something to? Predicted data is a data frame. What happens if I assign something 
in double brackets and I give it a name here. What does that do to a data frame? Yeah, I'm generating a new column. I'm generating a new column in predicted data. The name of the new column I'm generating is whatever name is here for mod. So it means the first new column I'm going to generate is going to be a column called intercept only. The next one is going to be linear. The next one is going to be quadratic. And the last one is cubic. I'm generating new columns in a data frame inside of this loop. So the first column on the first iteration that I'm going to create here is going to be equal to the predict function. Predict is a way to extract predicted values from a regression model. I just say predict fitted LMS mod. Well, fitted LMs here is all the different LM, the linear regression output from the, all those models I ran a minute ago. They're named. So if I say fitted LMs name mod here, the first iteration mod is going to be intercept only. It's going to look in fitted LMs. It's going to look for the element named intercept only, which is the entire linear regression model we just ran. It's going to give that to predict. And predict is going to be like, oh, I, I can do predicted values for this model. The new data is going to be equal to the predicted data. Well, predicted data is exactly equal to our simulated data. This is me giving the original data back to it and it just running it through the predictions. Okay. So what this is doing again for each named LM model output that we produced in the previous slide, I want to get predicted values for the associated model using predict. I want to save those predicted values as a new column in predicted data. Those values of mod become new columns in this data frame. It looks like this. So that loop, we started with the x and the y values. These were our simulated data. That loop then created four new columns of predicted values. Intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. Okay? Intercept only, you'll notice, has the exact same number for every one. Do we know what that number is? Yeah, it's the mean of y, right? Negative 0 0.464. It doesn't vary, it's a constant. Then the other ones actually have values that depend on values of x. These are all predicted values. We can then gather these up. So if we wanted to plot these in ggplot, this is a case where we have one, two, three, four different variables across that are all really the same thing. Each of those are a predicted value. If we wanted to plot them in ggplot, we don't want them in separate columns. We want one column that has predicted values and another column that records which model they're from. Right? We can do that with gather that I introduced last week. So I say here, Let's load up the tidier library. We're going to say tidy predicted data is equal to predicted data, that data frame before. I'm going to gather and create a new column called model, a second column called prediction, and I'm going to gather every column in the data set other than x and y. This is like select syntax. You can use a minus and say don't do this, but gather everything else. It'd be exactly the same for me to say gather, intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. Then I want to mutate the variable model, make it into a factor with its levels equal names models. This is my way of reordering it so the model comes in the same order as the vector of names of models we ran before. The data are going to be huge now. So what I've done here is that basically every these four columns have been swept down to be really, really, really long. Okay? So the data are now like 2,000 elements long or something like that. Uh, what is it? 1,200 long. So I've looked at, I've peeked at a few different values of this. I did tidy predicted data, and then I want rows from 1 to 1,200 in elements of, in, in spaces of 100. So I'm looking at every 100th observation of the data because the data are arranged by model. We can see we have like observations for intercept only, for linear, for quadratic, and for cubic, and then the predictions for each of those models for every value of x and y. So we have a really, really tall data frame that has a bunch of different models and a bunch of different predictions for them. Well, now I can throw this into ggplot to look at it. If I want to do that, I'd say something like this. I want to do a plot, ggplot. My data are going to be my simulated data, my sim data. I could have used tidy predicted data x, y, too. would have worked fine. But 
sim data, A, E, S, X is X, Y is Y, I'm going to make points. The reason I'm doing points is I want to plot all my original actual data, the noisy data, onto that plot. Then I want to overlay on top of it a bunch of lines that show our predicted lines, because our regression predictions are going to be these nice, smooth lines through our data. Notice here I'm saying geom line data equals tidy predicted data. Inside of a geometry like this, I can give a totally different data set to plot on top of a previous data set. That's what I'm doing here. I'm saying data equals tidy predicted data because I want to predict line or draw lines for my predicted data. AES, X equals X. Y equals prediction. I'm going to group them on model. With a GM line, that means all the elements or all the predictions for a single type of model will all be connected by a line. I want to color them by the model. I'm going to make them partially transparent, and I'm going to make them a little big. It looks like this. These are all the predicted trends from each regression model we ran, ordered in the correct model order. This is the intercept only model. This is the linear model. The quadratic and the cubic follow each other pretty closely. So when you look at this, what do you think is the best model? They're pretty similar. So if you have a simple model and a slightly more complex model, and they have the exact same predictions, which one is the better model? The simpler model, the parsimonious model, right? We can see it kind of goes nicely through all of our data like that. It looks pretty realistic. If you'd seen the math, if you remember the math I used to generate these data, it makes sense the quadratic model would be the best because I generated it using a quadratic function. One would hope it would fit the best. Okay, so we have predictions. On the other hand, just looking at a line like this, it's like, okay, that looks like it fits well. It might not be, it's not a way that we can generate a nice metric, like a fit statistic for something, however. If we want to do something like that, one of the best ways to generate a good general purpose fit statistic for a bunch of different models is cross-validation. What cross-validation is, is it's a method that will use um, the ability of a model to predict data left out of fitting that model um, and compare it to like the actual values. I'll explain it here in a minute. So the idea between, behind cross-validation is you will take your data. Let's say we had 100 observations we might split it into 10 folds. That is, we would take our 100 observations and then each 10 observations would go into what we'd call their own fold. We'd separate it into 10 pieces. Then for each fold, so for each of those 10 observations, we will fit the model using all of the data except the data in that particular fold. So we would say, we would say fit a model using 90% of the data then we would make predictions on that 10% of the data we left out. And then we could repeat that for every single one of the folds in the data. So we're essentially seeing how if you leave out every possible different like 90% of the data, how well does it do predicting that part we left out? Okay? This is for doing out of sample prediction. Then we gather all those predictions together and we calculate some measure of accuracy. The one I'm going to show today is the mean squared error, the formulas like that, but you could use any other measure of fit that you want. Okay. The idea with MSC here is that a model that fits the data well will have a low mean squared error, the lowest ideally mean squared, mean squared error. Models that are too simple will have a high mean squared error, and models that are too complicated will either have a similar or possibly worse mean squared error than a simpler but equivalent model. So if we want to do this, we follow sort of the same process we did with the linear regression. We again begin by pre-allocating something to store all of these models or all these things we're going to run. So let's say we have our data, and I want to do, like I said before, we're going to do cross-validation with 10 folds. I'm going to make a new data frame that will hold all the data, and also the sampled fold numbers, because we're going to randomly assign the data to different folds. Okay. <clears throat> to do that, I'm going to use the sample function without replacement. So what sample does in R, sample, uh, if you give a data frame, a vector, or something to sample, it will just, by default, it will pull out every observation in a random order and just kind of spit them out. If you give it some n below the total size of the vector or the data frame you give it, it will randomly sample that many observations from it, but it'll just grab random ones. 
In this case, we're going to have it sample the entire like set of data that we want because we're going to use it to randomly sort our data into uh, just a random arrangement. You want to do that because if you're doing something like this validation, let's say all the observations are ordered on some variable, you don't want to put all the observations of one type in one fold, all the observations of another type in another fold. They need to be randomly assigned to these folds for this to be a valid operation. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to say I want to do 10 folds in my, val my cross validation. So it's going to be broken up into 10 different chunks. My CV predictions, my cross-validation predictions, are again going to be equal to my sim data that I began with. That's just the X and the Y column, the simulated data I started with. It's because I want all those X, Y values there, and I'm going to add some stuff to them. Then I'm going to create a new variable in CV predictions that is equal to, and this is a somewhat complicated piece of syntax, I'm saying I want to sample from repeated numbers. The numbers are 1 colon k, k is 10. This is the vector of integers 1 through 10. I want to sample from the numbers 1 through 10. Length dot out equals the number of rows of CV predictions. So I'm going to sample from 1 to 10 as many times as necessary to fill up something equal in number of rows to the predictions. And replace equals false. If I was doing replace equals false, I'm going to sample through this vector, which is the numbers 1 through 10, repeated sufficiently to be equal to the number of data. In this case, I think we started with 300 observations. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, repeated until it's length 300. Okay? I'm just going to sample from that vector until I run out of numbers. This is a complex sounding way to randomly assign the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10 to each element of our data set. There's going to be an equal number of 1s to 2s to 3s to 4s to 5s to 6s, 7s, 8s, 9s, and 10s so that every fold is going to be the same size, but every, not, every observation is randomly assigned to a fold. Okay? Then we're going to create a bunch of empty columns to store our predictions in. So I'm saying CV predictions, assign NA to names models. Names models, there's four different models. This creates four different columns with the names of those models. So we get a column, intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. This data here generated something fold, 958316, randomly assigned numbers 1 through 10 to our observations. Okay? It's okay if you don't know exactly what's going on here. This is sort of a complex example. Yeah. this. So, I can break this down. Yes. Uh, right here? Yeah, assign fold. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I could show an example of, of what this is doing here. If I go, okay. So I haven't set these values, so I'm going to say this is 300. Okay. That's all that that is producing. This is producing a whole bunch of random numbers from integers 1 through 10, but it's making sure that in case with length out 300, there should be 30 of each one of these numbers. It makes sure there's 31s, 32s, 33s, 34s, all that an equal number of them, because we want the folds to be equal size. That's all that that's doing. It takes a little bit of code because we're very specific about what we want it to do. Okay. There are other ways to do it. I like that one. So, we've generated something that looks like this. We have one row for each observation in our data, that is each value of x and y. Each one of those observations is assigned to a fold. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get a predicted value from each of these models, given these values of x and y, for each one of the folds. Okay. To do this, we're going to loop inside of another loop. This is called nested looping. It's really common. In fact, every computer device around you, every electronic device has many loops going on inside of other loops continually. Putting loops inside of each other is perfectly fine. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to loop over the models and then within each model we're going to loop over all the folds in the data and make a bunch of predictions. Okay, so conceptually you only have to worry about sort of one part of the loop at a time. We can imagine that, okay, let's say we're going to do the intercept only model. 
the first iteration of this outer loop is intercept only model. Then with the intercept only model inside of this loop, we're going to say, okay, for k in one decay, so for iteration one, we set k to one, the first fold, and we do a bunch of stuff in here. Then we'll move on to the second, the third, the fourth, fifth value of k. Once we get to whatever k is, it's 10, we'll finish out the 10th iteration. This loop finishes. It then goes back to this outside loop, goes to the next model, and then does this interior stuff 10 times again. So it's a loop, like a circular loop, inside of a larger circular loop. Nested looping. This is the kind of thing that if you've never encountered it before, you'll be like, I fucking hate this class, but that's okay. Sometimes you gotta play with it, you gotta mess with it and see how it works to get used to it. Nested loops are a little slow in R, but there's some things you can only do in a nested loop. One of the most common operations of a nested loop is let's say you need to change every value in a data frame based on some, on like some calculation, but it's unique to each cell. Well, it's two loops. Do one loop for the columns, and then inside of that, one loop for each value of that column or each row in the column. It's really common. Okay, so inside this, so if we ignore, don't worry about the model, just imagine that we're an intercept only model, the first iteration of this, what are we going to do? We're going to say the fold rows are going to be equal to CV predictions dollar sign fold equals equals K. This is saying, okay, I just want a vector of trues and falses because we're just in equality right here. I want a vector of trues and falses that is true if fold equals our current fold and otherwise it is false. So that means that approximately 10% of our, well exactly 10% of our observations are gonna have a true and all the other ones are gonna be a false, okay? Then I say, I wanna fit a linear model using our original formula, models, mods, or to begin with, it's our intercept only model, but the data I'm gonna to use to fit it is equal to CV predictions, the rows that are not in our fold rows. So that leaves out that 10% of observations that are in the particular fold. This is me leaving out the data that we're gonna do predictions on. Then I say, okay, we have this model, I'm gonna call temporary model. Then I want predictions of this. I say, we're going to assign to CV predictions, the fold rows, that is the rows, the folds of the omitted data, the named column, whatever is our current model, is equal to predict some data temp mod, temp mod is the output from this linear model, and the new data is equal to our CV predictions, our fold rows. So it's the exact opposite of this. This was fitting a model using everything except our fold rows. This is doing prediction using only our fold rows, and then assigning those predictions into the particular rows for the, that fold and the particular model we're currently on. There's a lot going on here. Do you have any questions about it? To write this? Yeah. A couple minutes, probably. I do a lot of this. Yeah. Um, again, uh, the, the first slide, going back to the first slide, so when we sum code the data, or we use the graph. So what's the difference between the graph for SP? What's the difference with the, between the graph and the four? And, and what? <laughs> the loop. Oh, um, well, rep, what rep does is rep generates a, just a vector, right? It generates a vector of values. So rep here is generating the numbers one through 10 repeated to be length 300. So it's just one through 10, one through 10, one through 10 until there's 300 elements. Rep does that. The loop could do that. You could do that with a loop, but it's gonna be slow. What the loop allows us to do is run lots of different operations based on some values. So this was just me. So this whole sample and rep code was just a way to generate these numbers. So it was a way to, for me to say, okay, I need, of my 300 observations, I want 30 of them to be in fold nine. I want 30 of them to be in fold five so that I could always remove those observations, run a model, and then predict on those observations I left out. So is that the logic of the next slide, two slides, two slides, uh, 
one of the poles to run mm -hmm. the linear, linear relation. Yeah, so the idea, again, here is what I'm doing is um, for any given model, I'm going to run through every one of the folds. There are 10 folds, right? And within these, what I want to do is I want for each fold, I want to leave out all the data in that fold, run a model, and then see how that model that doesn't include those data, how well it predicts the um, values for the data that we left out. This is what you call out of sample prediction. Okay. So the idea here is that if a model does a really good job with predictions for data that were not used to fit the model, we have more confidence in the model. If a model does a really good job predicting the data that was in the model, but you give it similar data from somewhere else and it just does a crap job, that model is not good for prediction. And that's actually really common in the social sciences. In some data set you'll work with, you can make a model that you're like, wow, my R squared is like 0.97. It's amazing. You give it some new data, and it completely fails to predict everything. It's because your model was overfitting to the data or something like that. Cross-validation is a way to address overfitting your data, giving it too many parameters. Models with a really, really high R squared are not necessarily better. Models with really high R squared should be a warning to you that you've probably overfit your data. Good statistics class teach that. But, yeah. Okay, so does that make more sense? Okay, another question. Yes? So, in terms of folds, um, you said that 10 folds for a number, like, is that a common number, or like, does it have to be a fold size that you can assume you might have a lower MSE? Uh, yeah, so the MSE is going to be a function of the, the case. So, this is the purpose of this, of cross validation, is not for getting one fit statistic, it's for comparing a bunch of different candidate models. Um, so you might want to, I mean, it's all relative. It's kind of like an AIC or a BIC score. If somebody gives you a single AIC score and gives you one model, they probably didn't know what AIC is a measure of because it's an arbitrary, unscaled measure. Um, this is kind of the same thing. What you want is the model of your candidate models with the best mean squared error. But if you go to compare to somebody else's study, you can't make a cross comparison. Um, you could, if they were using the exact same data and the same number of folds, you could make a comparison, but that's about it. It's the same thing as an AIC or a BIC. You could compare to somebody else's if they're using the um, exact same degrees of freedom. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But it's for comparing candidate models. This kind of comparing candidate models is really, really good if you're doing like data science and you fit a couple thousand different models with different variables and you just burn through. You know, you've got your like hundred fold cross validation model, you leave it running overnight, you come back and you're like, these set of this super set of models, like it might be like 30 or 40 models that all fit similarly, you'd look at those. There's more advanced way to do that that are based on um, logical trees and things that actually fundamentally are kind of working in a similar way to this cross validation. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Can I, can I ask, yes. Of course. Does that mean that I do use ten percent of the data to run a model and use the rest to ninety percent to run another model? Uh, well, I'm actually using ninety percent of the data to make the model to get the parameters, and I'm using ten percent of the data um, to predict those values and compare them. So, if we have a data frame that looks like this, and I've broken it into, say, in this case, I've broken it into four folds, I would use these data here to fit the model, so that model is going to give me a bunch of like beta coefficients. Then I'm going to take these values here, multiply those essentially x beta, and get some predicted y. And I'm going to compare this predicted y to the actual y's in that data and get the mean squared error from that. Then I'm going to go to the next one, the next one, and the next one. And I'm interested in. The, the difference between the actual y and the predicted y, but I'm doing like, I'm fitting this one model. Once I use this fold, I'm gonna fit these chunks of the data, do that comparison there, then I'm gonna go to this fold and use these chunks, then I'm gonna use these chunks and look within that. And then we're gonna sort of sum up all of those mean er errors for all those different folds, and whichever one performs the best is the one that overall per performed the best on all folds combined. It is complicated, I know, but it's really neat. And the nice thing about the code that I gave here is you can steal this and use this in any of your future stats classes and it will work. So please do. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay. And you can see this is something quite complicated that we're getting into in 
the sixth week of a basic intro. Our class, I know. It's okay. It's fine if it is just like... Okay. Something you can come back to later. But I want to demonstrate the power of loops and give you something you could steal and use in your own work. Okay. So, the next thing we do is... What we want to do is let's write another loop that will compute, compute the mean squared error of these cross-validation predictions. So the squared error is equal to the difference between the real values and the prediction squared. The mean squared error is the mean of all of those squared errors. So add them all together, divide by the number of them. We can get our cross-validation mean squared error by first I pre-allocate some vector. It's of length equal to the number of models. Its names are the names of the models. Then I just say for modeling names of models, the same thing I've been iterating over, over and over and over again. I just say my predicted squared error is equal to my CV predictions Y minus CV predictions model. Remember CV predictions model here are the fold predicted values. So this is saying actual Y minus Y hat or predicted Y squared is a predicted squared error. And then I'm going to say, this is a vector with all of the squared errors. So there's one squared error for each prediction. Then I just take the mean of that squared error and assign it to the particular model element of this CVMSE vector, and then print it. We see the mean squared error for intercept only is 1.953. For the linear, it's 1.9. The quadratic, 0 0.955. And the cubic, 0 0.981. Now we actually have a numeric metric to compare those models we saw before. And the cool thing is it agrees with exactly what we saw visually. Our quadratic model has the lowest mean squared error, also in cross-validation prediction. Because we're doing this cross k-fold cross-validation, it's also introducing a little bit of noise into our cubic model that makes it perform visibly worse than the quadratic model because it's overfitting the data. Okay. So this would be a way that you could use, essentially take this code, use it to fit models. It can be generalized to basically any type of model with a little bit of tweaks and run a bunch of CV on that. Okay. Any other questions about how this one worked? It's the math I basically just did on the board right here. It's the exact same thing. Okay. So next thing I'm going to talk about, changing gears, getting away from the terror example of cross-validation. Um, I want to talk about conditional flow. Conditional flow is a basic core programming thing. If you link together loops, the ability to loop your data with conditional flow, you can essentially program any logic that exists in any computer bar none. Okay? All computers are based on essentially two things, loops and some sort of conditional flow. Okay. So, Conditional flow is using if statements and else statements. Up to this point, we've seen the function if else to do logical checks and assign things. So um, if else was something we could use to run through an entire vector and then see if each value in that vector was, say, equal to some value, greater than some value, less than some value, it would return a bunch of trues, falses, which would then be converted, say, into ones and zeros, into values like yes and no. If else was a function we used to create variables and mutate, right? It's for checking a whole vector. If you want to check a single value at a time, you want to use not if else, but if, and then the separate function else. It works something like this. Here's a loop here where I've just given for i in 1 to 10. So we're going to loop through the numbers 1 to 10, where i is becoming 1, 2, 3, 4 in each iteration. But what I want to do is I want to do something different depending on what the value of i is, something completely different. This code says, first, if i percent percent 2 equals equals 0, do people remember what that does? Percent percent? Somebody tell me. It's the remainder. It's the modulo operator. This says if I take i, divide it by 2, it produces the remainder. So if something divided by 2 has a remainder of 0, it is an even number. So in case this thing is divisible by 2, I want it to say print, paste, the number i is even. It's divisible by 2, it's an even number. Okay. But if it's not divisible by 2, this statement here will return a false. If an if statement returns a false, it does not run the code inside of it, but it will instead go to the next line. So it says else. Okay, well, 
That would say, let's say we're giving it the number seven. Seven, that's a false, go down here. Else, if I, which remember in this case is the number seven, if I divide it by three, is its remainder zero? In this case, it's false, but I'll pretend it was a six. If it was a six, we would say, oh, remainder equals zero. Then print paste the number i, or six, is divisible by three. And if that is not true, it will go down to this one. There's no if statement here. So no matter what, if it makes it to this point, it's just going to run this. It will say paste the number but i is not divisible by two or three. OK? What does this do? It does this, looping over the numbers one through 10. Number one is not divisible by two or three. The number two is even. Three is divisible by three. Four is even. Five is not. So on and so forth. So is run through the conditional flow of this statement. I look at something like this, and this is saying, OK, if this is true, do this. If not, do this other thing. If this is also not true, then do this third thing instead. This is actually how R, for instance, how you'd write error messages in R. It would be something like if you're expecting a numeric argument to like the mean, it would just say, if is numeric, get the mean. If not numeric, where the hell's my numeric variable? Right? That's how error messages are. They just print something out. OK. Does that make sense? Conditional flow. Trues, falses. OK. So if, like this, aside from an example like that previous one, is good for doing things like handling special cases in your data. Let's say you've written a function or some loop, and it works for 99% of things in your data, but there's one thing you need to handle differently. You can throw an if statement in there that catches those things. Let's say you have an, a statement that will, won't work for some NAs, but you can't drop those NA observations. You can say, just don't do anything for the NAs, but then do, do, do this numeric operation for everything else. Right? It's kind of like an NA omit in your loop. Yeah. So if statements can be used to make a loop ignore things or fix particular cases, it's also, like I said, useful for producing error messages or generating a message based on an input value if it's not what you expect. Okay. So <clears throat> some common operation that I, I'm pretty sure I make you do on the next homework. Yes, in fact, I definitely do. Um, one common use is to use R in a loop to load a bunch of data files, a whole bunch of data files. Very commonly, if you work with, say, administrative data, um, they will give you the data where, I don't know, you've got five years of data and every month is its own file. You don't want to sit and load, right? If you've got two years of data and you've got 12 files per year, we're loading 24 files, it's conceivable you could do that. If you're working with a longer time span and you've got hundreds and hundreds of files, you don't want to manually load every single one of those files. You want some reproducible code that you can just press Bouton and get code out or get data out, right? So a common way to do that is with loops and if statements to fix things. So if you're interested, this is an optional one, there is an extended write-up from Rebecca Farrell, who's the person who very first taught this class a very long time ago. Um, on that she attempted to make a lecture or homework assignment on loading in some uh, administrative data from a state source. Um, but because it was administrative data, nothing was uniform about the data. And in fact, the website used to obtain the data had nothing uniform about it. So I believe she wasted the better part of a week of her life coming up with an example for why sometimes like automating things can still hurt your body and soul. Um, this is actually kind of fun. It shows you that even somebody with a tremendous amount of programming experience can find themselves pulling their hair out dealing with basic like programming and data things. It's a good example. If you feel like you're going to spend a bunch of time downloading files from the internet like automating it or something, especially like spreadsheets, read this for an example because it will teach you important lessons on how to avoid common problems and it also will teach you things like how to automate the generation of URLs to download files and things. I don't require it though. Next type of loop I'm only going to briefly talk about is the while loop. While loops are lesser used, particularly in R, um, but they are still common in the general world of programming. Rather than iterating over some predefined vector, like the numbers 1 through 10, a while loop just keeps running until some condition is no longer true. Basically, it has, imagine it just has true, 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 true. As soon as something becomes false, it stops running the loop. An example of that, a toy example here, is Let's see how many times we need to flip a coin to get four heads to come up. So I pre-allocate two things, which is just the number of heads we have and the number of coin flips I make. <clears throat> then I say, 
well, the number of heads is less than four, keep going through iterations of this. Keep doing this thing. I'm going to say the current coin flip is a N1 size 1 50% probability draw from a binomial distribution. That means it's going to be a 0 or a 1 50-50 chance of either. It's a coin flip. Then if the coin flip is a 1, I'm going to say 1 is heads. If it's 1, increase the number of heads by 1. If not, do nothing. If the number of flips, uh, oh, and then assign number of flips 1 no matter what. So this increases the number of heads by one only if a head comes up. This increases the number of flips by one regardless of whether a head came up or not. Then run this loop until we hit four. Number of flips was 11. This said I had to flip a coin 11 times to get four heads when I loaded these slides. I've seen this number as low as four before and as high as like 15 by random draws. That is simulating a coin flip. <clears throat> If anyone ever wants you to simulate coin flips like this from a binomial distribution, steal my code. It's right here. It comes up in early stats classes sometimes. <clears throat> but that's a while loop. So you, yeah. Sorry, um, going back. Mm -hmm. So if you look at perpendicular, you can change it from perpendicular. Yeah. Yeah, you can, um, you can link these things together. And if you can come up with a way to string any sort of logic together, I mean, if you can figure out a way to generate trues and falses or a number to get what you want, you can definitely do it. You'd have to figure out how to frame the problem. So I'm not entirely sure. So are you asking, did the model cut predict a particular value? Is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah, for the example, you did ask whether it predicted the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the easiest way to do that would be to generate it exactly the way I, I sort of did it before, but then process the output of that through some like conditional statement like that. Mm -hmm. You could feed it all in, and the way to do that most easily would be to write a function that does all of that, which we're going to learn about next week. Yeah, um, the easiest, I mean, you could actually make it so that in all that cross-validation code plus any add-ons like that, you could all put them inside of a single function that would allow you to give it a bunch of like linear regression models, press one button, do all the cross-validation, output it, then do that conditional flow and be like, this model didn't pass this bar, this model didn't pass this bar, this one did. Something like that. We could do that all inside of a function. That's actually how I write most of my code nowadays is I do it all encapsulated in functions. But um, we'll get into it next week. It's kind of cool. We're gonna do it mostly for plotting next week, but you could use it for something like that. I try and avoid too much stats except scaring people at today's lecture. Okay, no. next. So, we've talked about some loops. Vectorization is about not doing loops. So, let's say we have some vector of numbers, some really big vector of numbers, and we wanna add one to each element. So in this case, I've randomly generated one billion numbers and assigned them to my vector. <clears throat> if I wanted to add one to each element of that vector, you could do a loop with it, but it's going to take a pretty long time because a billion length vector is pretty big, right? So what I do here is I, if you ever want to time something on your computer, the way to do it in R is proc.time, assign it to an object, then whenever it's done, do current proc time minus the start value, and that gives you how much time it took different parts of your computer to calculate something. I did this as an example. So if I do a loop where I say the new vector is going to be equal, is beginning with I'm pre-allocating NAs equal in length to my vector, so I'm making another one billion element vector, then I just say for position in one to length vector, new vector's position equals the previous vector position plus one. This is saying this is a length one billion vector first element, make the first element of this other one billion vector equal to this element plus one, this element plus one, this element plus one, this element plus one, one at a time. One billion calculations, boom, boom, boom. As you can imagine, doing one calculation at a time, going to the next one one billion times can take a lot of time even though computers are fast. In this example, it took my computer about 50 seconds to do this addition operation on a vector of a bi length billion. 
I do not recommend copying and pasting this code onto your computer either, by the way. You will need a lot of RAM to do that. So, if we instead use R's vector addition, I could take this length 1 billion vector and just say, my vector plus 1, R will take care of everything else behind the scenes, and as you can see, it will do it about 38 times faster than doing it in the loop. Okay? The idea here is that vector and matrix math in R is a hell of a lot faster than loops. R is really, really fast in vectorized operations like letting it recycle and do the addition. It's way faster than looping things. There's a couple reasons for it. One of the reasons is that a lot of the vector and matrix stuff that R does isn't even written in R. It's written in much faster low-level languages. Some of it's written in Fortran, some of it is written in C++. Those are both ridiculously fast languages. By being written in those, they go a lot faster. Your for loop is in R, it's interpreted, it's slow. Something like this, 38 times as fast. I've done operations where I've seen speed ups of 100 or 1,000 times over doing something with a loop by vectorizing in the right way. Okay, so some examples of vectorized commands in R that are gonna be way faster and usually also much easier to use than a loop are things like row sums, call sums, row means, and call means. If you want to get the sums across rows or columns, or you want to get the means of rows or columns, you could write a loop to do it. Or you could write a tenth as much code and just call on some existing function that does it, which will also do it 100 times faster. For instance, if I have a matrix that looks like this, and I wanted to get sums across the rows of this matrix, I could just say row sums a matrix 22, 26, 30. The sum of those is 22, the sum of those is 26, the sum of those is 30. Right? Row sums. You could do a loop to do that, but you'd have to actually think about it. Vectorized functions like this tend to just work. They exist already and they're fast. Okay, other examples. There's a lot of vectorized functions that do things that you might not have encountered before or might not be like something that pops out to you immediately. The cumulative sum, cumulative product, cumulative minimum and maximum will get cumulative quantities back. If I give like the vector one through seven the cumulative sum, it does one, one plus two, one plus two plus three, one plus two plus three plus four, so on. Cumulative sum, you do cumulative products. P max and P minimum will take matrices or sets of vectors and output the max for each position in them. This is a vectorized command. So I'm giving P max a vec three vectors, zero, two, four, one, 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 and two, two, two. It gives me back two, two, four, the highest number in the first position is 2, the highest number in the second position is 2, the highest number in the third position is 4. Position max, position min. There's vectorized things like these. For things that you might think the first thing you want to do is write a loop, generally the loop should be your last resort for anything you do. It will always be slower, it will be easier to mess up, it will be harder to write, but it can do things that you cannot do any other way. So, there's no additional homework this week because you're just going to do the part two of the homework you turned in. Um, but I do I recommend, if you're interested, um, that data download demonstration that's on the course website. Um, it's shorter than it looks because it's like half or three quarters error messages, right? It's horrible. Um, and if you're going to do something like automated data downloading and cleaning, I recommend reading it because it will give you ammunition to attack that in the future. Um, and also it will give you a preview of how to load files in using a loop, which will be on the next homework. Um, that's about it. People have questions? Hopefully not too terrifying today. Okay. Get out of here. Monday. Um, I'm thinking I will be here Monday, but if I will not be, I will send out a message. I'm going out of town this weekend. I'm not 100% sure whether I'll be back on Monday. If I'm not going to be here on Monday, I will figure out a solution for that because I want people to be able to have access to me. But just in case I'm not going to be here, get to your homework a little bit early, email me, Slack channel me, and stuff like that. If you've managed to get through the first part of the homework, the second half is easier. If you haven't gotten through the first half of the homework, the key is now posted, so read through it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.